In the previous class, we discussed about the different types of bond portfolio strategy. And here, uh, what we discussed that uh, let there are three types of uh, bond portfolio strategies what the fund manager or the investors always use. Uh, and within that, uh, if you want to define, those are basically already we have discussed about the passive strategy, passive bond portfolio management strategy. Then uh, broadly whatever way we can define in the different books have defined in different way, but we have defined it like this semi active strategy and another way is it is a active strategy. These are the three types of uh, strategies used for the bond portfolio management and here in the case of passive strategy we discussed about uh, extensively in the previous class that is basically buy and hold strategy in large extent and also we talk about the indexing and within the buy and hold strategy we also discussed about the laddering. Then here we have discussed about the dedication or we can say the cash matching and within that we have talked about two things one is your pure dedication strategy, pure dedication and another one is your uh, it is the with reinvestment, dedication with it is without reinvestment and it is the basically the pure cash matching and but here we talk about these things that with that we can talk about there is a concept of uh, reinvestment is involved in this case. But here whenever we talk about these things, also we talk about the, uh, we started the discussion on immunization. What this immunization basically talks about, but here everything depends on the value of the bond, but nobody talks about the, how the realized return, uh, return can be materialized for the investor for a stipulated period of time. Therefore, the concept of immunization basically comes into the picture, which basically try to neutralize the two types of risk, which is defined as the price risk and another one is your reinvestment risk. Because the price risk and the reinvestment risk both move in the opposite direction. If your interest rate basically these are the parts of the interest rate risk, if your interest rate goes up then the price risk basically also goes up, but the reinvestment risk goes down. That means, if the interest rate goes up, the value of the bond goes down, that is why that is downward price was risk, uh, this price risk of the particular bond. But in that particular time, if you observe that the coupon what this particular investor is going to be receiving. Uh, for that the reinvestment risk will be very low, because in the market this uh, uh, investment opportunities are more, it is because the interest rate is higher. That is why that way the reinvestment risk can be neutralized, uh, can be, uh, can be in, uh, decreased. So, the price risk and reinvestment risk both will be offset to each other. Therefore, in this case what you can say? Uh, the immunization technique basically attempts to derive a specified rate of return during given investment horizon regardless of what happens to the market interest rate. So, basically here we are uh, minimizing the uh, interest rate risk and one thing is what you can say the basic objective of uh, this immunization strategy is the, uh, the bonds duration should be matched with the investment horizon period of the investor. That means, 
if my investment horizon period is 5 years, so I should hold a bond whose duration is 5 years, not the term to maturity. That means, obviously, if you go by the principle, the term to maturity definitely will be more than the duration. There are certain conditions which basically prevails if the immunization strategy will work. Uh, what are those conditions? The conditions are basically the present value of the liabilities should be equal to the present value of the assets of this particular investor. The duration of assets should be equal to the duration of liabilities, what the investor has and the convexity of assets in the portfolio should be greater than the convexity of the liabilities. These are the three conditions should be satisfied if the immunization strategy is going to be used to minimize the interest rate risk in the market. So, how this immunization strategy basically works? Let us see that uh, how this immunization strategy works. Let you take this example in this case. Let uh, there are bonds available, let there are yield to maturity is given let 7.9 percent for 5 years bond. That means, the uh, term to maturity that means, term to maturity is 5 years and because of the flat nature of the uh, yield curve let uh, the because of the flat nature of the yield curve, the yield to maturity of 5 years bond is equal to the yield to maturity of 6 years bond. That means, the term to maturity equal to 5 years and 6 years for this is for one bond, this is for the second bond and the yield to maturity is same for both of them that is 7.9 percent. Let we assume the coupon also 7.9 percent and the power value of the bond power value of the bond is let 1000 rupees, power value of the bond is 1000 rupees. Then what is the objective of the investor in this case? The objective is the investor should maintain and it is investment horizon period let the investment horizon period is 5 years. So, the objective of the investor is the ending value, ending value or we can say the ending wealth ratio, the ending wealth ratio of the investor should be, should be 1.079 to the power 5 is equal to 1.46254 that should be maintained after 5 years. What does it imply? It implies the investor should get 1.46254 for each rupees 1.46254 for each rupee invested in the bond. Therefore, the ending value, the ending value of 1000 rupees should be 1462.5. This is the basically the objective of uh, the investor. The investor should get this much should be the wealth ratio 
and this must should be the ending value of this particular or this particular value of the investment should be 1462.54 at the end of the 5 year. That is the objective what the investor has. Then let us see now the investor has two options. Uh, one he has he can invest in a 5 years bond or he can invest in a 6 years term to maturity bond or he can invest in a bond where the duration is 5 years. So, when the interest rate changes, how this particular risk both price risk and as well as the reinvestment risk can offset to each other and how this total value of the wealth what the investor was interested or is interested to maintain at the end of the investment horizon period, how that can be kept that is the basic objective of the particular investor has. Uh, then uh, that uh, let this market interest rate in the first case the market interest rate remains constant at 7.9 percent and particularly we can say that what is the return to maturity the term to maturity is 5 years. Let us see what is happening. If you make it, let this is your year, this is your cash flow, this is your reinvestment rate and this is your ending wealth. Okay. Year 1, year 2, 3, 4, 5. Let us see that how this thing can be maintained. So, in the first year there is the cash flow is 79, 79, 79, 79 and end of the fifth year basically he will his get is 1000 rupees which is the par value of the bond. So, now the reinvestment rate is 7.9 percent already you know. So, the 7 point instead of 7.9 there is no reinvestment available for the first cash flow because at the end of the first year only it can be used. So, second year it will be 7.9, it is 7.9, 7.9, 7.9, here also it is not available. Then the ending wealth is 79, here it is if you calculate it is 1.079 to the power square into 100 that is 164.24, this is 256.22, it is 355.46, it is 462.54 and obviously, in the end of the period it will be 1000 1, plus this it is 1462.54. So, this is the wealth ratio for the investor has at the end of the 5 year if the reinvestment rate remains constant. So, there is no change in the market interest rate. Let the market interest rate has declined then now if you want to calculate the ending wealth, the ending wealth for the bond if the market yield declines to 6 percent in the year 3. Let the other things is remaining same in the first year, but at the year number 3 at uh, the market interest rate has declined from 7.9 percent to 6 percent. Like that if you want to make this table, this is your year, this is your cash flow, this is your reinvestment rate 
and this is your ending wealth. One, two, three, four, five, five, the end of the value. So, then what you can observe from this, the cash flow in the first year already you know, the first year was the yield was 7.9 percent, that is why it should be 79, second year also 79, because coupon is not changing. The coupon remains same every year it is 79, 79 year also 1000. Reinvestment is not available here, this is your 7.9. At the first year, in the third year, whenever we have said it will reach it, the interest rate declines from 7.9 to 6 percent, so that is why 6.0 it will remain same 6.0 like that. Then the ending wealth was 79, it is same. 164.24, but here if you see whenever it is 6 percent, then the ending wealth value will decline. Previously it was 256.22, but now it will be 253.10, this will be 347.29, this will be 477.13, then final value will be 1477.13. So, what we can observe here that this value of this particular, uh, the ending value of this particular security has, we are expecting it should be 1462.54, but this value is basically has gone down to uh, this uh, as increased to 1477.13. But now, let in this same condition we want to calculate for the 6 years bond uh, where the duration is 5 years. Let the term to maturity 6 years, but the duration is 5 years of the 6 years bond. If you assume these things, let us see that how this particular interest rate is going, uh, this change in the interest rate behavior is affecting this ending value or ending wealth of this particular bond. So, here we want to calculate the ending wealth, ending wealth for bond, uh, second bond, bond 2, if market yield declines, declines to 6 percent in the year 3 here the term to, to maturity is equal to 6 years, we are hypothesizing and the duration is 5 years. Let us see the duration is 5 years. Then what will happen in this case, if you observe that let 1, again we can take this is your year this is your cash flow, cash flow, this is your reinvestment rate, this is your ending wealth. end up the period 5. Let us see if the in the same situation, if you are investing in a bond whose duration is 5 years, how this particular wealth ratio can be maintained. The cash flow is same 79, 79, 79, 79, 79, here it is 1000. Uh, but here the one thing is the cash flow, basically we have to check it, because the price of the bond 2 with 1 year left to maturity and a market yield of 6 percent is we have to calculate. So, this cash flow it cannot be 1000, it 
cannot be 1000, we have to calculate this cash flow. And the market value of the market rent is 6 percent. So, the price we have to see or to write here the price, the price of bond 2 with 1 year left to maturity. and a market yield of 6 percent is basically you calculate it will be 1017.92 the value will be 107.92. So, if reinvestment rate is 7.9 percent it is 6.0, here it is 6.0, here it is also 6.0, so not known. Then the value is 79, the same 164.24, 253.10, it is 347.29, this is 477.13, but finally, the value of the value of this, this plus this, that will give you 1465.05. So, which is very much close to our objective in the beginning, whatever we have taken, the objective was basically 1462.54. So, it is more or less say same with this thing. Therefore, we can say that instead of if your investment horizon period is 5 years, so instead of holding a bond whose term to maturity is 5 years, we should hold a bond where the duration is 5 years. By that, when the reinvestment risk is uh, or the because of uh, the changing nature of the interest rate, the value of the bond goes down, this uh, reinvestment risk aspects also, uh, the invest reinvestment risk is basically goes up by that it can be cancelled to each other or the interest rate has increased the value of the bond goes down that time the return can be maximized through reinvestment like that the bond holder can offset to reinvestment risk with the price risk and the opposite can happen whenever the interest rate goes up we can observe that the value of the bond goes up but uh, the value of the bond goes down but the reinvestment rate risk will be more in that case which will offset to each other. So, in summary what you can say if the uh, rate of interest goes up then the value of bond goes down which basically the price risk is increasing. So, in that case what will happen that uh, reinvestment risk reinvestment risk is declining. So, the price risk and reinvestment risk basically will offset to each other. So, the opposite may happen whenever the rate of interest goes down value of the bond goes up. So, that is why the what will happen the price risk declines, but the reinvestment risk of the investor goes up. So, again the we can assuming in this case also the price risk more or less equal to the reinvestment risk. So, finally, we can manage the in totality we can manage the in interest rate risk because the interest rate risk is basically nothing but it is the combination of the price risk and the reinvestment risk. That is what we can use this bond immunization strategy whenever we use it in the market. Then coming to the active management strategy, in the active management strategy 
we have the various methods through which the bond portfolio can be managed. One is your interest rate anticipation, then you have the valuation analysis, then you have the credit analysis, then the yield spread analysis and the bond swap. These are the different five ways through which the bond portfolio can be managed actively. Let us see one by one how this portfolio strategy basically works whenever we deal with the instruments like bonds. Uh, if you see here that interest rate anticipation, uh, generally in the literature we consider interest rate anticipation is basically is the risky strategy. Interest rate anticipation or predicting interest rate or anticipating interest rate, this is the risky strategy in the in the bond portfolio management process. So, here what this particular strategy we are trying to say that reduce the portfolio duration when the interest rate uh, interest rate is expected to increase and vice versa. That means, here what it is uh, trying to say here there is a, a minor mistake here. Uh, if you observe here that reduce the portfolio duration when interest rate is expected to increase and vice versa. What does it mean that increase the investment in the long duration bonds when interest rates are expected to decline? That means, what this particular strategy were trying to say that we should invest if you are expecting that the interest rate is going down, if you are predicting the interest rate is going to be down, then what you should do? You should invest in long term uh, expected to if interest rate decline, you invest in the long term and uh, low coupon bonds. You should invest in investment in the long term and low coupon bonds will be more. Why it is so? It is because if there is inclining, there is interest rate will decline, then what will happen that uh, there is some kind of loss because of the reinvestment uh, opportunities, uh, the reinvestment return basically will decline, but the bond value price, the bond price will be up. So, in that case in the short means in the long run if you are expecting these things, then you should invest more money in the long term in the low coupon bonds. By that you can manage or hedge your interest rate risk and also the return can be maximized. And like that if you observe that interest rate is going to be uh, the move into the shorter duration bonds if the interest rate is going to be inclined, it is basically inclined. So, here what I am trying to say that uh, whenever you are predicting that interest rate is going down, you invest in the long term and low coupon bonds. If your interest rate is going up, then you invest your there is some kind of money you can keep it with you and if you want to invest the invest in the short term and high coupon bonds. This is the strategy basically what the investor always use, but the question is basically the fundamental question is how the interest rate can be predicted, how the interest rate can be predicted, but if you go back to your previous discussion, some of the things, some of the theories which talks about interest rate, they generally discuss that how the interest rate is going to behave, which basically depends on the supply and demand forces. And But the biggest question is that the supply demand forces basically is very difficult to observe that how these two particular functions can behave 
in a particular time period. Therefore, what you can say that interest rate strategy is the risk case strategy what the investor always uh, use in the market. Then we have uh, uh, some of the another strategy always the uh, sometimes the investor use that is the valuation analysis. What basically they do if you go by the equity valuation part also what you can say that uh, if you calculate uh, by using any of the discount flow model or either it is dividend discount flow or the free cash flow models if you can calculate the intrinsic value of a bond then what generally we can do we can always compare this intrinsic value with this actual market value and from that we can say that whether the uh, particular stock is overvalued or undervalued uh, and accordingly we take our decision in the market like that here also the same strategy can be applied in the bond portfolio management and we can decide when we should buy this particular bond and when we should sell this particular bond on the basis of their valuation of this particular bonds. So, here what generally they do select the bonds on the basis of their intrinsic values and the question is which are those factors which affect this intrinsic values of the bond. The normal interest rate already you know and as well as the cash flow apart from that the interest rate or the coupon. Uh, interest rate of this particular market and in terms of the coupon whatever cash flow you get that basically varies on the basis of the bonds rating and also the call features of the particular bond. What does it mean? That means, if you go back to the previous sessions what we have observed there that if the rating is higher we are expecting that the return uh, the interest rate of this particular bond will be lower, but if you observe that this particular bond has more risky features like call features like the kind of default call etcetera, etcetera. Then we can say that the premium of this particular bond or return from the particular bond should be higher, the expected return of the particular bond should be higher. So, there are certain characteristics which basically determine how this particular bonds value can be determined and there are certain features which basically uh, talks about this particular concept in the market. So, then what is this particular managerial implications from this and how this managers can take the decision that uh, which bond should be bought and which bond should be sold. In this case if you see then they said that buy the undervalued bonds and sell the overvalued bonds. In the same technique basically whatever way the uh, equity portfolio management strategy case we discussed. Uh, in the portfolio management process in terms of the uh, equity. Then we have another approach or we use another approach that is called the credit analysis. What this credit analysis is basically means? The credit analysis basically it, is a, it involves a detailed analysis of the bond issuer to determine expected changes in its default risk. If the default risk is higher then obviously, the premium should be higher and that is why the return should be higher, but the default risk is lower then we can say the we can expect that this particular bond is less risky and we can expect the return will be little bit the expected return will be little bit lower in that case. So, therefore, the credit analysis is basically talking about the uh, expected changes in the default risk of the bond issuer. So, here in this context what basically first the concept has been discussed by the Altman and Namacher, what generally they discussed that they tried to find out which are the or what are the internal and external factors which affect the credit rating of this particular company. And internal means we refer to the company specific factors and external means we refer to the particular factors res with respect to the macroeconomic context or which is outside this particular firm or outside this particular company. And how this particular model he has developed uh, if you observe here they call it this Z score model. They call it it is a Z score model. What this Z score model was trying to explain is this model is basically <coughs> used to to predict the bankruptcy.
the z square model is used to bankruptcy and uh, it combines this model basically combines the traditional financial measures with a multivariate technique and what we call it that multiple discriminant analysis multiple discriminant analysis to derive basically the set of the weights for the specified variables and the result is an overall credit score of the each firm. Then how basically the credit score is given? What this Altman has said that zeta is equal to a 0 plus a 1 x 1 plus a 2 x 2 like that plus a n x n. So, here what this zeta means? It is the the overall credit score of the company, overall credit score of the company and the x 1 to x n these are basically the explanatory variables which basically have the impact on the credit score of the company. On that basis explanatory variables which basically helps to assign some scores to the particular company and a 0 to a n these are nothing but these are the coefficients, these are the coefficients and here which are those particular variables which particularly affect uh, this particular thing. He has said that the major variables are explanatory variables are uh, profitability of the company profitability means they have referred it this uh, earnings before interest in tax earnings before interest in tax divided by the total assets. Then you have the like that he has taken this another thing that is the uh, stability of the profitability stability of the profitability which is nothing but the standard deviation of this standard error of the estimate of uh, the CBIT by TA for the 10 years. Then you have the debt service capabilities which is nothing but the interest coverage ratio and interest coverage ratio is EBIT by the interest coverage or the interest charges. So, another variable he has taken. So, then they have the uh, cumulative profitability cumulative profitability what does it mean it is basically the return earnings divided by the total assets and x 5 is basically the liquidity which is nothing but the current assets by current liabilities. this is the current assets by current liabilities. Then you have x 6 which is nothing but the uh, market capitalization level or we can say that uh, market value market value of equity market value of equity by the total capital then we have the size of the company which is basically the uh, total uh, normalized or ln of total tangible assets. So, these are the different variables which basically uh, have the impact on this uh, uh, zeta or the credit score of the company. So, what this analyst basically do? before investing in this particular bond, they try to discuss, try to analyze those variables what we have identified here and after analyzing those variables, they can measure this credit score on their own and on the basis of their credit score, they can uh, say that how much risk or default risk this company has. 
and uh, finally, they can decide that how much return we can expect it uh, expect from this particular uh, bond investment and whether this particular bond is uh, worthy to be invested in that particular period of time or not. So, this is uh, the way the credit analysis works. Then uh, another type of analysis always we use that is uh, uh, basically uh, or we can say that always people have used that uh, uh, what is this uh, yield spread basically yield spread analysis what always we use by the uh, theory or used by the different kind of uh, bond investors. And what the exactly this yield spread means? The yield spread means it is basically the spread between the spread between the high graded and or we can say high rated and low rated bonds. So, here what it basically means that in a different time period if you observe that the uh, spread between the different bonds even if uh, they are in the same term to maturity will be different on the basis of their credit rating or on the basis of their other aspects. Then which are those basically factors which affect the spread? The spreads which are affected by this let uh, we can say one factor is business cycle. So, what people have studied regarding this? They said uh, at the recession, at the time of recession, at the time of recession, the spread has been more. What is the logic behind that? At the time of recession, why this spread has been more? It is because this there is more risk in the market, more risk. So, if risk is more, then the premium also should be more and the investor will charge more premium. So, if the premium will be more, then there is a the gap also between these two particular bonds or particular different rating bonds also will be more. So, therefore, at the time of recession, at the time of bad phases, we can say that the spread would be more and at the time of good phases, the spread will be less. So, that is the argument uh, what this uh, investors or the fund manager were trying to give. So, in this context what you can say that the business cycle is the most important factor or the macroeconomic condition is the most important factor who basically decides what should be the spread. Then uh, if you see this uh, another factor the major factor is volatility in the market interest rate. That means, what basically this market in the market interest is nothing but the demand supply fluctuation. So, once this market interest rate will be volatile, it will have the impact on the different types of the bonds. So, if the different types of the bond will be affected, then automatically what will happen that the spread between the different type of instruments, financial instruments which are available in the market also will be the spread between them, the return between them will be also varied. So, therefore, the volatility in the market interest rate which basically decreases or increases the value of the bond depending upon the characteristics of the bond that basically increases or decreases this yield spread in a particular time. So, what the investor does? He basically decides the yield spread by looking into by analyzing the yield spread he says that what is the condition of the particular market and by analyzing the condition he can decide where to be invested and the whether we should invest in this bond or that bond and what kind of interest rate is going to be prevailed in the market. So, all these things can be known. So, that is why what we can say sometimes most of the time we use this yield spread uh, which can measure this business cycle and from there we can predict that what kind of investment alternatives will be suitable for the investor at that particular time period. Then uh, the other one is uh, the bond swapping. What basically the bond swapping means? The bond swapping means it involves liquidating a current position and simultaneously buying a different issue in its place with similar attributes but 
having a chance for improved return. So, therefore, what basically we have to find out another candidate for that which may have the different uh, or more or less same characteristics on the basis of the objective of the investor, but having a chance that this particular bond can be improved further, the return of this particular bond can be improved further. So, the main purpose of this particular bond swap is the portfolio improvement. <coughs> Which are those different types of the bond swap? We have a pure yield pickup swap, we have a substitution swap and we have a tax swap. And how this pure yield pickup swap works? The pure yield pickup swap basically involves swapping out of a low coupon bond into a comparable higher coupon bond to realize an automatic and instantaneous increase in current yield and yield to maturity. That means, the picking up the swap is possible when the two party the counterparty will be available or two markets will be available that particular time and the different alternatives on the basis of their objective or on the basis of the requirement uh, the two instruments should be also available in that particular time. So, here somebody is expecting that the interest rate will behave in one direction, another investor is expecting the interest rate will behave in opposite direction. So, in that case their understanding is basically the opposite about the market about the prediction. So, then the swapping is possible between these two. Therefore, in this case what this uh, pure yield pickup swap is talking about it involves swapping out of a low coupon bond into a comparable higher coupon bond to realize an automatic and instantaneous increase in the current yield and yield to maturity. Therefore, he feels that that generally this current yield should be more, he feels that I do not need the current yield. So, therefore, he is going for a higher coupon bond and he is going for a lower coupon bond. And he also feels that I should invest in a long term bond that is why I should go for long term low coupon bonds and here he feels that I should go for a short run higher coupon bonds on the basis of the interest rate behavior just now we discussed about that. What is those advantages in this case? Here we do not have to speculate anything, we no need for interest rate speculation, no need to analyze the prices or overvaluation or undervaluation, no specific workout period needed because the investor is assumed to hold new bond to maturity. That means, here what we have observed, he needs the current yield should increase immediately. Therefore, he is swapping the low coupon bond with higher coupon bond. Maybe another fellow who is swapping this bond with him, maybe does not need this increase in the current yield that particular time, maybe he wants to stay in the market for a certain period and by looking into the interest rate behavior and other things, maybe he can maximize his return in the future. But in this case, what we have observed that he needs this particular current yield immediately that is why he wants to swap it with a low coupon bond, with, uh, he wants to swap with the high coupon bonds. And what are the disadvantages? The disadvantages is increase the risk of call in the event interest rate decline, reinvestment risk is greater with higher coupon bonds. So, if you are observing that reinvestment risk is already the uh, reinvestment uh, return is very high or the market interest rate is very high we are expecting that reinvestment rate will go down, then the reinvestment risk in the market also will be higher in the future. So, this is the disadvantage we can have whenever we talk about the pure yield pickup swap. Then if you talk about the substitution swap, and the substitution swap what basically we do, it is generally short term in nature, it is it relies heavily on interest rate expectations it is subject to more risky than pure yield pickup swaps. The procedure assumes a short term imbalance in the yield spread between issues that are the perfect substitutes. The imbalance in yield spread is expected to be corrected in the near future. Then only the substitution between the two bonds can be possible. Then what is the advantage? The advantage is the realization of capital gain by switching out of your current position into higher yielding obligation and the disadvantage is the yield spread thought to be temporary in fact be permanent 
thus reducing the capital gain advantages, the market rate may change adversely. What basically we have observed from this, the characteristics of the substitution swap, it is highly dependent on the interest rate anticipation. If we are on the beginning, we said that anticipating interest rate is the most risky strategy in the market. Then second thing, this substitution swap is relying more on the anticipation of the interest rate, then it is very difficult to use it in the market in the real sense, number one. Number two, that if you compare, if you discuss about the yield spread at a particular time, we can say that the yield spread basically is a concept which may vary on the basis of the business cycles or on the basis of the different macroeconomic conditions. But here what we have seen that if you assume that the particular yield spread, even if there is a high spread now, we are assuming that this will be corrected in the next future. Therefore, we want to substitute this bond with another bond depending upon their characteristics then sometimes we are also in the uh, uh, verge of the more risk, it is because that the yield spread is basically a long run phenomena depending upon this market macroeconomic situation. So, if there is nothing in the hand of the investor regarding the macroeconomic fluctuations, then this thing also cannot be realized or this thing also cannot be predicted. So, therefore, these are certain limitations to be used and this substitu substituting with very perfect kind of uh, uh, assets with another asset is very difficult to find in a particular market. So, that is why the substitution is sometimes is not possible. Then we have the tax swapping. Uh, here in the tax swapping, it is purely due to the tax laws. It does not need any interest rate projections, does not have any kind of economic meanings. So, what this bond investor is trying to do in this case, they always enters into the tax swap due to tax loss and realized capital gains in their portfolio. In the already we know that there are certain bonds which are tax free, there are certain bonds which are not tax free. So, that is why what generally they do or in a particular time period the finance end of the financial year this capital gain will be this much or that much. So, in that case they want to swap it with some another bond which has the opposite characteristics of this particular bond. So, like that they can save some tax or also they can minimize their risk in terms of uh, the fluctuation in the capital gain. Therefore, it is not linked to interest rate, it is long not linked to the other bond characteristics, it is directly linked to the tax laws and the other obligations by the regulators. Therefore, what we can conclude here that uh, the risk of the bond is all measured or is all calculated on the basis of the interest rate fluctuations and coupons and as well as the uh, basically more risk basically the bond investment gets from the interest rate fluctuations. So, any investment in the bond portfolios or any fund manager who tries to fund in terms of the port bonds tries to minimize the interest rate risk in the market, but the interest rate risk is the most volatile and as well as uh, very uh, difficult kind of risk always we face in the market, because it is very difficult to predict the interest rate. There is no such kind of anticipation, very clear clot, very, very, very thorough anticipation will be prevailed in the market or to predict the interest rate. Therefore, uh, depending upon the demand supply situation in a particular time, uh, if we can predict the interest rate, maybe the bond investment will be more profitable, but if you are not predicting the interest rate perfectly or the certain factors which affect this bond returns like your coupon, your pi value etcetera, then what will happen? The bond investment may not be profitable for the investor, but still it is less riskier than the equity investment and as well as some part of the bond investment can be predictable and also the bond invest there is certain characteristics of the bond what we have seen from the passive portfolio management and other strategy that the certain kind of income maximizer, uh, maximizer can invest in this particular bond to maximize their return if they know their investment horizon period and they know their liability from the beginning. So, this is about the bond portfolio strategy and who can get the maximization of uh, on how this income can be maximized from the bond investment and this is the way, this is the different methods through which 
the bond portfolio management can be carried out. So, in the next class we will be talking about the other instruments and how the other instruments basically used in the investment part uh, or the equity investment or in, in general the financial investment in the market. Thank you.